Following the cancellation of Professor Dr. Ferdinand Porsche's VK45.01P heavy tank project, the Germans were left with 100 built chassis, including several completed tanks. As these represented a huge material, financial and time investment, a solution for reusing these in some form had to be found. One solution was to modify them as self-propelled anti-tank vehicles, which the Germans ultimately did. The majority of the aforementioned chassis would be rebuilt for this purpose. These would be armed with the powerful 88mm L71 gun and protected with 200mm frontal armor, making them formidable adversaries on the battlefields at the time. Despite the small numbers built, these would see extensive combat use during the war, where their effectiveness would be plagued with many mechanical and logistical problems. Hello, and welcome to another voiced article from Tank Encyclopedia. I'm your host, Dan, and today's article on the Panzerjäger Tiger P, or Ferdinand, was written by David B. Now, before we go on, I need you to give me just a moment for a message from the folks higher up the chain of command. As you may well have noticed, we here at the Tank Encyclopedia YouTube channel have been cranking out a whole lot more videos than we used to lately. Now, while this is great news for all of you guys, it does mean that our video editors have been doing a whole lot more work. So, if anyone who knows anything about video editing is listening to this, we're looking for volunteers. Just make sure you're punctual and can put out at least a video a week. If that sounds like you, leave us a comment. Or, better yet, slide into our public Discord. Links in the description. In September of 1939, Dr. Porsche was appointed as chairman of the German Panzer Commission. This commission was composed of the owners of major industrial plants and their leading engineers. Their primary function was to give suggestions and new ideas for existing tank designs, as well as to devise all new designs. By the end of 1939, Dr. Porsche had begun work on designing components for a new heavy tank project for the German army. In cooperation with Oberingenieur Karl Rabe, Dr. Porsche made it his first plans and calculations for a new vehicle referred to as Porsche Type 100 in early December 1939. The Type 100 was to be powered by two air-cooled engines placed at the rear. Each of these engines was then connected to an electrical generator. These were used to provide power to the two electric motors placed in the hull. These were, in turn, used to power the front drive sprockets. Eventually, due to urgent needs of the development of the Tiger program and a number of problems identified on the T-900, such as huge fuel consumption, suspension problems, etc., the project was cancelled. By the end of May 1941, Hitler issued the requirements for a new heavy tank project. These included armor thickness up to 100mm and the use of an 88mm gun. Dr. Porsche began working on his new design during July 1941 and, two months later, the first drawings and calculations were ready. Similar to the previous vehicle, this project was initially designated as Typ 101, better known today as VK45.01P. Construction of this vehicle was given to the Nibelungenwerke. The first prototype was completed in April 1942 and presented to Hitler on his birthday, 20th April. Hitler must have been impressed, as Dr. Porsche received a production order for 90 vehicles plus 10 with a hydraulic drive, in May 1942. Following a number of rigorous tests, the VK45.01P proved to be complicated and mechanically unreliable. The competing Henschel prototype was also prone to malfunctions, but was, nevertheless, deemed to have a better overall design. At the end of August 1942, the Reichsminister of Armaments and War Production, Albert Speer, had the opportunity to examine Dr. Porsche's work at Nibelungenwerke. Witnessing the overall performance of the VK45.01P, Reichsminister Speer insisted that at this project be cancelled, despite having received great favor from Hitler himself. Due to the many mechanical problems and the overcomplicated design, even Hitler agreed that the vehicle was a failure and, on 22nd November, or October depending on the source, of 1942, he officially ended Dr. Porsche's heavy tank project. As the VK45.01P chassis was already produced, 
they presented a huge financial and resource investment, which could not be simply discarded, so something had to be done on the, that matter. Vaproof 6 made proposals to mount 150, 170, or even 210mm heavy guns on them, but nothing came from these proposals. Hitler proposed to have them modified and be used as Schwerer Stemgeschutz, or heavy assault guns. The frontal armor was to be increased to 200 millimeters from the original 100, and the vehicle was to be armed with the newly developed 8.8 centimeter Pac-43-2 anti-tank gun. In the following months, the precise role that this vehicle would fulfill was changed a few times. This Schwerer Schirmgeschutz was initially designated as T-130 by Alcat, which was responsible for the development of the prototypes. During its early development phase in late 1942, a number of different designations were allocated. One of these was Sturmgeschutz mit der 880 cm lang, or Tige Sturmgeschutz. At that time, the simpler Ferdinand name, given in honor of Dr. Porsche, was becoming more frequently used by the designers and later, even the troops. During February 1943, Vaproof 6 issued a list of potential names for this vehicle. These included Sturmgeschutz auf Fahrgestell Porsche mit der Lange 8.8, Panzerjäge P 8.8 cm Pack L43-2 L71 Sonderkraftfahrzeug 184, or the similar, or 88 mm Pack 43-2 SFL L71 Panzerjäge Tige P Sonderkraftfahrzeug 184. The simplest one was Panzerjäge. P. At the end of November 1943, Adolf Hitler gave a suggestion for a new name, Elephant. The name was officially adopted during February 1944 and came to be implemented during May 1944. Despite the common misconception that this designation was applied to modified vehicles that were used from 1944 on, this was not the case, as we read in both Jens and Doyle. For the Germans, the Ferdinand and Elephant were one and the same. Ferdinand was initially designated to fulfill the role of an assault gun. The major manufacturer of such vehicles, primarily the Sturmgeschütz III, was Alcat for most of the war. While Alcat possessed the necessary tools and manpower to complete the construction of the Ferdinands, it was decided by Vaproof VI that these were to be completed at Nibelungenwerke. Alcat would be involved in the construction of the first two prototype vehicles. In general, Alcat was unable to proceed with the Ferdinand project. It was heavily involved with Stug III production and could not free up its production capacity to be involved with another project. The Nibelungenwerke factory was initially involved in production of Panzer IVs. While it possessed production capabilities to conduct the construction process, Alcat provided Nibelungenwerke with a group of 120 skilled metal workers to speed up the whole project. As the construction of the Ferdinand required extensive modifications to the original chassis, other subcant contractors would be needed. For example, Eisenwerke Oberdano from Linz was responsible for making the necessary modifications to the hull. Siemens Schuckert, of Berlin, was to provide the electric motors in the generator. Krupp, from Essen, was responsible for producing the large casemates. On 16th February 1943, the construction of the first vehicle began. According to the original production plans, the last vehicle was to be completed by mid-May 1943. As the production of the first vehicles was going on, two Alcat prototypes were transported to the weapons test site at Kummersdorf in Magdeburg by order of Vaproof 6 for testing and evaluation. These two can be easily identified by the rear position flexible fenders and protective covers for the headlights, both of which would be removed on the production vehicles. One of these vehicles would be presented to Hitler on 19th March 1943 during an exhibition of new vehicle prototypes at the Rungenwalder Proving Ground. In a report dated 23rd February 1943, over a dozen deficiencies were listed for the second prototype. These included the fuel line from the left engine being in position too close to the exhaust pipe, it being difficult to check the oil level in the air compressor, and the fact that in order to drain the cooling fluid, nearly 50 screws had to be removed. 
In normal conditions, the Ferdinands would have probably spent months in the workshops as designers and engineers tried to resolve these issues. But in 1943, the German army was preparing for a new offensive on the Eastern Front. This meant that the only real option was to provide the Ferdinand-equipped units with Formwehrandrungen, or modification kits to be implemented in the field. The Ferdinand was divided into two parts. The hull contained the front two crew members, the electric drive motors, and the generators and associated petrol engines that provided them with power. The enclosed casemate at the rear held the 88mm main gun, the ammunition, and the rest of the crew. Each of these components was built using welded armor plates, with some elements being bolted together. The Ferdinand's lower hull could be divided into four sections. The front driving compartment, the main engines positioned in the center, the lower rear electric engines, and the firing compartment placed on top of them. The front part of the hull was where the driver and the radio operator were positioned. To provide the driver with some vision, a protected three-sided periscope was placed on top of his hatch door. In addition, there were two round visor ports placed on both sides of the inward-angled side armor. These two men were separated from the remaining rear position crew members. Their only way to communicate with the commander was by means of an intercom. Behind these true crew members was the engine compartment, which was separated by fire-resistant walls. It contained the two gas engines, the electric generators, as well as radiators and cooling fans, and oil and fuel tanks. In order to fit all these into the engine compartment, they had to be placed close to each other, which caused many overheating problems and even fires, which were not uncommon later during the Ferdinand's surface life. The engine exhaust pipes ran it internally on both sides of the hull. They exited through a small opening close to the fifth road wheel on both sides. The huge casemate positioned to the rear of the vehicle housed the 8.8 centimeter gun and four crew members. Its overall construction was simple, as it consisted of four armored plates and an armored roof which were welded together. The casemate itself was not actually welded to the hull, but was instead held in place by bolts. The front plate had a rounded opening in the middle for the main gun mount. To avoid getting rainwater into the engine, some crews welded two diagonal drains in front of the superstructure. In the rear part of each side armor plate, a cone-shaped pistol port was placed. These were actually plugs attached to chains. To the rear, in the middle of the casemate, there was a large round one-piece hatch. The Ferdinand suspension consisted of six large road wheels, a front idler, and a rear drive sprocket on each side. The six road wheels were divided into pairs and placed on bell cranks, which in turn were mounted on longitudinal torsion bar units. Each of these pairs were actually suspended individually. The shapes of the idler and drive sprocket were visually almost identical. The main reason was to prevent the track from falling off the suspension due to the vehicle's length and its lack of any return rollers. As Dr. Porsche's original dual electric engine system proved to be too complicated and unreliable, it was decided to replace it with a more orthodox power unit. Two Maybach HL120 TRM gasoline engines giving out 265 horsepower at 2600 RPM were chosen instead. Due to its weight, the Ferdinand was a real gas guzzler. With the fuel load, 950 liters total, carried inside, the operational range was 150 kilometers in good roads, while off-road, as was often the case on the Eastern Front, the operational range was reduced to only 95 kilometers. The maximum speed for a vehicle weighing 65 tons was a solid 30 kilometers per hour, but it could only be achieved on good roads and often for a short period of time. The maximum cross-country speed was 10 km per hour, or even less. The engines powered two Siemens Teep K58-8 generators. These would in turn produce the necessary power for two Siemens Teep 1495A direct current 230 kW electric motors, which were positioned under the casemate. Each of them was responsible for providing power to one side of the vehicle, being connected to the drive sprockets through electromechanical drives. The Ferdinand had formidable armor protection for its day. 
The upper front armor of the hull was 200 millimeters thick. This was not a single piece of armor plate, but instead two 100 millimeter thick plates joined together. The lower part of the hull was a single piece measuring 80 millimeters. The top part of the lower hull was 60 millimeters. The hull side armor was 60 millimeters, and the rear ranged from 40 millimeters, or 60 depending on the source, to 80 millimeters. The bottom armor was 20 millimeters thick. The superstructure frontal armor was 200 millimeters thick. It too consisted of two separated armor plates held in place by a combination of welding and bolts. The side and rear armor were 80 millimeters, and the top was 30. The Ferdinand had a crew of six separated into two groups. The first group consisted of the driver and the radio operator, who were placed in the front hull. The remainder of the crew, which included the commander, gunner, and two loaders, were positioned in the rear casemate. The commander had only a limited view of the surroundings by using the Schrenen Fernrohr scissor periscope, and only with the hatch open. The loaders had two Turmbeobachtungs Fernrohr, or observation periscopes. Somewhat surprisingly, for German standards, the commander was not provided with a command cupola, and thus his view of the surroundings was quite limited. The main armament of the Ferdinand was the 8.8cm Pack 43-2 L71. It had a semi-automatic vertical sliding block breech. The 88 had a traverse of 30 degrees, 15 to each side, and an elevation of 5 degrees down to 14 degrees up, or 8 degrees down and 18 degrees up, depending on the source. The traverse and elevation hand wheels were positioned on the left side of the gun and were operated by the gunner. Despite being such a huge vehicle, the, the total ammunition load was quite limited, with only 40 rounds. These were held in storage bins located inside the casemate sides. The Ferdinand crews would often use any available spare space to add additional rounds, reaching a total load of 50. Authors such as Melleman mentioned that some crews managed to squeeze in up to 90 rounds. When firing at longer ranges, the Ferdinand crews used the SFL Zilfanroor 1A type, type telescopic sight. When engaging targets with direct fire, the Rundblick Fernrohr 36 periscope sight was used. While the Ferdinand could be used as mobile artillery thanks to its armament's range, sufficient elevation, and firepower, it was rarely used in this manner. While the 8.8cm gun could fire either armor-piercing or high-explosive rounds, the Ferdinands were initially to be armed with armor-piercing only. Prior to their first engagement at Kursk, each Ferdinand was supplied with 20 two-part HE rounds. These proved to be of poor quality and prone to jamming during extraction. Regarding the armor-piercing rounds, there was more choice, with few different types available. These included the standard Panzergranat 39-1 and the improved Panzergranat 39-43 AP, which had a range of 4 kilometers. The Panzergranat Patron 40 was a tungsten cord armor-piercing shell with the same range of 4 kilometers. Lastly, the Grosse Patron 39H1 and Grosse Patron 39-43H1 hollow-charged rounds were available, which had a range of around 3 kilometers. When using the standard AP round, the gun could penetrate 182 millimeters of armor sloped at 30 degrees at a range of 500 meters. At 1,000 meters, this dropped to 167 millimeters, and at 2,000, to 139. The tungsten ground at the same ranges and angles could penetrate 226 millimeters, 162 millimeters, and 136 millimeters, respectively. If the Germans had problems with the supply of tungsten, this round was rarely used. The hollow charge round could penetrate 90 millimeters farmer inclined at 30 degrees at any range. These hollow charge rounds were not well known for their precision, and when the target was hit, there was a good chance that the round would miss fire. The Ferdinands were equipped with a two-part rectangular-shaped shield, which was bolted on the front part of the gun mantlet. Its purpose was to protect the main gun from any small-caliber rounds or shrapnel. Not all vehicles received these from the start, 
some were added later, just prior to combat use, while some never received them at all. During the latter part of the Kursk Offensive, a number of crews improvised some by completely redesigning the gun shields, which could now be much more easily replaced. After 1944, these would become standard equipment and replace the earlier designs. For protection against infantry attacks, the Ferdinand was equipped with an MG-34 machine gun with 600 rounds of ammunition that was stored inside the vehicle. In addition, there were two 9mm MP-38-40 submachine guns. That's all for this video. Make sure to follow our website, we'll be releasing new articles on the regular. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram or Reddit and if you use Discord there's a link to our community server in the description. Also likes, comments and subscriptions on YouTube are greatly appreciated. If you would like to help us continue to develop and expand also consider donating on Patreon or PayPal. All of the funds will be used to help us enhance and design new articles and features for you. Until next time, keep us in your sights.